Wait, no, it's doing it. Hello, everyone. Can you guys hear me okay? I'm, uh, YouTube has changed the way they do their live stream. So um, if you can hear me okay, I just want to make sure everything's connected fine and you guys can hear me just fine. So if you can, please say something in our chat box over here. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Penny. All right. Good, good, good. Yeah, um, last night as I was setting up for the live stream, I realized that YouTube changed their interface. And they used to give you the option to work from the old um, interface, but now they're like forcing you to move over and it was like required a whole new setup and now I'm gonna have to send everyone a new link. Uh, can I turn up my sound? Let me see if there's a way to do that, hold on. Is that better, Lori? How about this? Okay, perfect. Is that too loud now? Because I, I did turn it up. We'll get started here in just a second. Okay, perfect. All right, I'll leave it at that then. All right, everybody, welcome and thank you for coming to our live session. I know it's early for some of you in different parts of the world. Um, so I thought I'd do this, uh, those of you who've uh, done the live sessions before, I'm going to do this a little bit differently. We used to do the Q&A at the end, um, and I'll probably still offer that, but I would like to start off because there are a lot of students who are not part of the critique group, but they want to um, ask some questions. So let's just start off with a really brief Q&A. Um, I know there was um, one question, I think it was uh, Ludmilla, we talked about how you can um, create a grid in like a program. So we had been posting on our forum about different apps. There's a couple of different grid apps, but I just wanted to show you guys if you guys have a tablet um, how you can very easily create a grid um, in Procreate. So that's the program that I'm using. And um, if you just create a canvas, what you want to do is go up to this toolbox here and say insert a photo. And then it'll bring up your photos and then you can insert a picture. So that's one way to pull in a photo like this. Um, and if you click this little box over here on the right side, you can see different layers. And what you want to do is hit the plus to add a new layer over your image. <clears throat> and you want to make sure that's on top of the image because you can drag these and move the order of them. Um, and whichever one is on top, it's very like uh, similar to show, uh, Photoshop. Um, whichever one is on top is going to show up. So you want to make sure you're on that second layer. And then to create a grid, you can pick a different kind of brush. I'm just going to use an inking brush. Um, something, let's see. Something that's just going to help me create a straight line. Um, over here on the left, you can control the thickness of that line and the opacity of that line down here. Um, so just to make this easy to see, I'm going to do this in white. So to create straight lines in Procreate, what you want to do is draw your line from corner to corner and then hold it um, with the pencil or whichever um, stylus you're using. You want to hold that in contact until it straightens out. So you can draw a wiggly line and it's going to straighten it out um, into whatever design you do. So it kind of has like a drawing assist. Um, so I'm going to thin that out just a little bit. And so to draw that grid, it's pretty easy. You just draw your line from corner to corner. You find your X. 
and that helps you find your middle. So you can then draw your, your lines up and down. So you're kind of creating that star and this gives you your, see how my line is wobbly, but so long as you're starting off at the middle, it'll straighten out. And so now I have my quadrants and then I just can complete the X in each quadrant. Or if you want to look at it another way, you can create a diamond. Just a very easy way to create your grid digitally. You can always do this with a pencil on top of a print, but if you're working from a monitor or a screen, some people like to paint from their iPad, um, then this is a very easy way to show your um, grid. Hi Kathy, don't worry about being late. It took us a few minutes to kind of get set up. So all I'm talking about is how to create um, a digital grid using a, this app like uh, Procreate or you can even download, I think Photoshop is releasing pretty soon, a Photoshop version for iPad um, or tablet. So this is just a very easy way to create um, the grid. Does anyone have questions about that? Oh, thank you for mentioning that, um, Anne. If you are having trouble, sometimes it helps to refresh the page um, that you're watching this on. So um, if you're, or if you're experiencing any kind of lag um, or like uh, pixelation, then sometimes refreshing your page can help. Um, the grid is, um, no, it's not necessarily a permanent layer. You can uh, remove it here. That's why I did it on a second layer. So you can, um, so after, let's say you have the grid here and you, all you need to do after that is hit share and then you can export it as a JPEG, a PDF, um, you just say J uh, JPEG and then it asks where you want to save it. So you can um, send it over to your Mac if you, you have um, any kind of connection with like AirDrop or you can save the image to your device. You could print it. Um, there's a lot of different options. And this is, of course, I'm working on an Apple product, but I'm sure it'll work very similar if you're on an Android product. Um, and so you can also export the image by itself, but you don't really need to because um, you already have that image, for example, if you're importing it. So, um, so yeah, so the layer is, so long as you do it on a separate layer. Now, if I had drawn the grid on top of this, um, then it's actually on this image and then it's more permanent. Does that make sense? And there's a little undo button down here in the lower left below these bars here. So you can hit undo if you accidentally draw on the wrong layer. Okay, so um, does anyone have any other questions regarding um, kind of what we talked about in the previous week's lessons or what we're you know, planning on doing next week? I know we had some people posting images of their still life in the forum and I've been giving feedback on composition and watching out for some of those tangents. But if anyone has any general questions, um, go ahead and type them into the chat and I'll address those before we get started on our critiques. <clears throat> now you will notice that there is a little bit of a lag between me talking. I have it on the low latency um, setting for YouTube streaming, so it shouldn't be very long, but sometimes there's a, uh, like a gap between when I ask a question and you guys actually hearing the question uh, streamed to you. So um, just expect that there might be a couple of occasional lengthy silences while I'm waiting for a response. So I just counted, there's about an eight second delay between me talking and, and uh, you guys getting the, the stream. So just keep that in mind. Um, 
Okay, so it doesn't look like anyone has any further questions. So let's go ahead and start, Penny, with your composition. Um, and for those of you who are critique students, if you're uh, tuning in but you didn't turn in anything, um, I sent out an email last night. We can You can submit your drawing next week. And um, Kathy and Penny, since you guys sent something in, we'll just do two drawing critiques uh, for you and we'll just get everyone caught up next week. Um, that's fine. I know this last week's lessons were really intense. There was a lot of footage to watch and there was also a lot of just information I threw at you. Plus you had to come up with your arrangement. So it's okay if your drawing took a little while. Um, these things kind of happen whenever you're teaching uh, online. It takes a little bit of time to watch the videos, but also for you guys to set up your still life and get feedback from me in the meantime. So um, Penny, let's go ahead and start with yours. And um, you had mentioned something about there possibly being some distortion because of, and I can see you used to have your grid on here, um, but you said there might be distortion because the ratio for your image here is different than for your photo or your drawing. Um, So um, I, I kind of did an overlay of the two, and really it's not as off as you might think. There's just a few small uh, changes that we'll kind of go over here. So I'm going to go in with maybe a blue pen would be easy to see where I make the corrections. So um, after the end of our session, I'll email you my edits. Okay, so um, I really like the composition that you have here. Uh, we had talked a little bit in the forum about some of the tension that's kind of created here with this corner. Um, and so we, I talked about just kind of continuing that wood across. I think that's going to help the composition quite a bit. And sometimes what I'll do is go and play in Photoshop a little bit when I, take, I have a photo reference um, and I'll kind of play with some of those tangents and see what I can do um, to work around them. Um, another area of that's pulling the eye and it's just because of contrast and you'll if you watch the video uh, lecture for this week, I released them last night, um, I talk about how value and contrast can be used to direct the viewer's eye in your painting. Um, and how you might intentionally want to play down other areas. So this is an area I would suggest playing down just a little bit. Even though the light is coming from this upper direction, what I would do is take this, this white value here on the cloth and make it more maybe like this um, and maybe brighten up what's happening in this central part. So that way the eye keeps focused here and not on this corner. And part of the reason is because you have some of your darkest dark in this corner as well. And that contrast between that edge and that darkest dark is going to pull the eye naturally. And plus you have a lot of corners and hard edges happening here and a lot of tight little shapes tend to pull the eye. You'll notice it doesn't do that over here where we just have this very dark, simple kind of line in the background. So um, keep that in mind as you move forward. And I think that will help a lot as well. I think in your drawing, there's just a few small things. I think the bird, the head on the bird is just a little bit big. Um, and this isn't by a large amount. But I think you could probably bring, slender that up just a little bit. I'm going to zoom in here. I'll pull that over so we can see a little better. So um, I think your overlap seems okay. I think it's this part that seems a little big. So if you could just bring that in, maybe shorten the top just a little bit. Um, it's not by very much, as you can see, but just like the thickness of the pencil. Um, can sometimes make something feel a bit larger. Uh, 
Um, I noticed that this feels a little narrow in here. Let me um, grab white again. So this here, this space. So I think you might just open this up a little bit at the top there. Let me try drawing that again. So it is a kind of a tight space. So I would just open that up a little bit and then you would end up pushing this out as well. And I think what that's doing is it's creating a feeling of more width and also you have this one so open that this, even though there is some foreshortening here, um, you can see that that width and this width are not that different. Um, so just keep, maybe check that area. So let me move this over here so we can see the whole composition again. Oops. Okay, so I drew on the wrong layer. <laughs> uh, let me show you how you can fix that. So I wanna separate what I've drawn over yours from this picture plane. So I just selected it and I'm gonna see. Usually there's an option to cut. Let me try that again. I don't know why it's not popping up. Maybe because I'm on, no, I'm on the right layer. Hmm, that's usually how I do it. <laughs> um, I'm not sure why it's not doing it right now. Oh, there it is. That's why it was on the wrong, uh, setting. So you hit this little squiggle at the top and you can select an area and then you tap and then you hit this and make sure you're on the add button and then you hit cut. And then you can just hit paste and it will paste it as a new layer in the same spot. So now I have that separated from my image. So I just wanted to move that back over. Okay, so I will go back to that layer and make sure I'm drawing on the same layer. Okay. All right, so um, also looking at this handle here, I think there's more of a width in this section and it's going to change some of that perspective. So I would just bring that line down a little bit. And just increase that width on the top because there's multiple planes that's happening here. We have this bottom, we have the side plane, which is like this edge here, and then we have the top plane. And you wanna give yourself enough space in there um, for those three planes. And then I think the same is true for the handle here. I would just continue that straight. It looks like you used to have it a little bit wider, um, and that maybe you thinned it out, so I would just widen that again. Uh, one thing I would suggest is to draw this pattern um, on the fabric. Um, you don't have to be real detailed about it. If you wanted to, you could just kind of look at these as like little ellipses and then go in and kind of break them down. So work on positioning first or like draw your straight lines for this design first. That's usually what I do when I'm doing a design. Um, and then you can draw the shape within that. That way you make sure you're staying um, parallel to the picture plane or the plane that it's 
um, laying on, so the tablecloth. Um, let's see. Everything else is looking pretty good. I don't see too many tangents um, that will create trouble for you. So just um, keep developing, other than correcting those small areas, I'm looking at the, the flower and, and stuff. Um, you might just consider marking out maybe the shadow and light pattern on the flower and draw it in a different color than white so you can see it. Um, so like right in here, there's kind of this shadow pattern. And I always find that it's helpful to draw those patterns. Um, like you do have the individual petal, but you have these little light shapes. So if you can kind of abstract it, Um, it helps. I can see you did some of that um, on this side of the flower. But like you might look at like separating these areas just with a little bit of a line so that way you know when you're blocking in this goes dark, this is light, this goes dark. Does that make sense? Um, you did that on your um, on your metal too and that and that's fine like on here you might even want to indicate that highlight just because it is such a strong shape your reflections in the glass here look great um, your wedges look maybe a little geometric here let me change my uh, color back to white um, you can see that there's like a little bit of more of an organic curve to that. So instead of having this so straight, maybe curve it back a little bit and move this corner over. And that will help to create a little bit more of a natural edge there. And that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, so other than watching out for that one um, area there with your tangents um, and the, that high contrast, let me catch up with some of your questions here. Um, yeah, the flowers, I mean, flowers are kind of like grapes. So it's made up of a bunch of small parts, but you want to look at it as a whole in the beginning. Um, you can add more and more detail as you build each layer in your painting. So even... Um, as you'll see when we go into, even more so in our first uh, grisaille pass, like this week we're doing a tonal sketch, but then we're going to do um, a more finished grisaille pass. I leave those grapes very simplified um, for that first grisaille pass because it's very easy to add detail on in a second layer um, rather than trying to get caught up with all those nuances um, in that early layer. Flowers are a little bit tricky because of that. So a lot of people get overwhelmed by grapes, flowers, anything that's like, it's like a bigger object, but it's made up of a bunch of little parts and details. It's easy to get overwhelmed. So um, one way to try to help you simplify that is to squint your eyes and look at that abstract light and shadow pattern. Like try to say, if I see this in two values, um, what, what would those patterns be? a light and a dark. And that can often help remove you from the idea, oh, I'm painting a flower. And that's often what trips us up, is that you're being uh, too literal about, you know, thinking about what you're painting. Um, you want to remove yourself a little bit from it and say, I'm painting shapes and values, essentially. So you're not drawing what you think a flower looks like, you're actually drawing what those shapes are. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, this, we're working, uh, and we're working on pennies. Um, okay, so do you have any other questions, Penny?
And uh, Penny, maybe um, the lecture that you have today on value design, you'll see how I talk about creating cohesiveness with something that's made up of a bunch of complex parts, um, using values to look at it kind of more as a unified whole. Um, you'll see kind of what I mean because I do a demonstration on, um, or like a little overlay on grapes and um, actually even on some flowers so you can kind of see how things should be looked at in terms of that abstraction. Alrighty, sounds good. Um, so moving forward, just continue to work on this drawing and if you're happy with it, you wanna check in with me midweek, um, you can submit it to me again and I can give you any last minute suggestions and then you can move forward or you can wait until our next critique. I'll leave that up to you if you want just to work on it slowly over the next week um, and wait to do the tonal sketch until um, next week um, then that's fine as well. Okay, just because I was giving some students a, a little bit more time. So you have even more time uh, to refine this. Alrighty. Okay, Kathy, let's go ahead and take a look at yours. Um, do you have any specific questions? I know you had mentioned in an email that you wondered if you should add something more colorful to your still life because it's very kind of monochrome. This can work as a composition. Um, I always, when you look at a lot of old master paintings, um, for example, if you look at this, it is actually fairly monochrome. If you look, it has a lot of browns um, and grays and really the only rich color on there is that green. So um, sometimes it just takes a tiny little accent to really enhance the feeling of color in a painting. I think this is actually an excellent example of that because we just have these earthy browns and then suddenly we have that nice rich green. Um, so that's something, oops, I clicked on the wrong one. Um, that's something you can think about adding. Um, you do have kind of that red, warm, dominant color scheme. So maybe try adding a complementary color in there. Um, it could be if you want to swap out the onion for something with a little bit of green in it or um, I've seen uh, compositions where they just add like a little bit of a piece of fabric. Like even if you wanted to throw in some like sprigs of some herbs that might work. Um, so like, let's say you left the onion, but instead of just having it so isolated, you went in and added, um, I'll just use a color. Let's get a oil sketching. Okay. Um, so if you wanted to go ahead and like, let's say you picked up some thyme or some rosemary or some kind of um, herb leaves that might actually be kind of a nice kind of little addition in here if you had a few sprigs that kind of led us into the composition you can have it on that diagonal just make sure it kind of cuts in front of you can have a few little sprigs coming off um, have it overlap that onion I'm only saying herbs because it would kind of fit the theme of the onion um, and you can see just having a little bit of that um, can help. Another way to enhance color, I know you're in a shadow box, but very rarely do we just set things in a shadow box in our home. Um, so if you wanted this to feel more finished in terms of uh, your composition, you could change like the background color um, to something that is more interesting. You could do like a deep blue-green. I'm doing this on your photo reference. <laughs> Let me do a, a new layer here. Um, so let's say you decide you want to make the wall kind of this blue-green color. You could choose any color. I would experiment um, in like a color study maybe with what you want to do. So you can see how that already adds a little bit more of a feeling of color. 
And then you could, if you wanted to add further color, you could make this very similar to my still life um, in the sense like I have a tablecloth. So you can make this whatever color you want. That's kind of a contrasting color. Let's pick something else. Um, let's just go more soft with that color. I'm just throwing out um, any color, but it's very easy to change something like this into, a, and you can see how that's already introducing some variation um, to the still life. I don't know what you were planning on doing with this space behind um, the wood, but you might consider, you could even do a white if you wanted, um, but do maybe a warm white here. So just think about um, maybe some options. If you wanted to do a red, you could do like a deeper kind of brick red that might help complement some of the uh, warmer objects, but it's a little more saturated because you have a little bit of red here in that jar and in the onions. So maybe just popping some more red there and then you could go like a deep um, black for the background. So I would just do some digital playing around with some of that. Um, you can do that in this program or you can do it, um, you can do actual color studies in oil paint if you want to spend the time doing that. Um, you can see how that even just introduces a little bit more color if you like that color scheme better. Just remember that if you're going to put a different color in the background here where I'm putting the black now, um, it's going to show through this little part on the jar. So what if you do put a different color back there, it's going to show through um, in the glass a little bit. Um, if you wanted to change out the onion completely, you could throw in um, Let me think what well, you could throw in I mean you could throw in a flower But if you wanted to keep it with like more of a fruit Maybe some green grapes Only because you have so much red and orange in the composition. Maybe try some green grapes um, Those might look nice there too if you didn't want to do the herb sprig um, what do you think about some of those ideas? So yeah, you can, you can experiment with any color you want in the foreground. A deep red might look nice and then just keep the background black even though you do have a lot of warmth in there, having just an area where you have a more saturated color and a little more contrast for this silver might be nice. You might even do a gradient. Um, it doesn't have to be all like straight black. You could do lighter to darker. Okay, so maybe try that um, and you can try playing, taking new photos um, and keep your composition the same for your drawing, but um, take new photos and experiment. Um, you could even, if you have any fabric lying around, you might try laying it down underneath your board in your composition just so you can see like what a real colored fabric would look like. Sometimes I like buying just sheets of felt because it's kind of a, a flat, color. Um, I also go and just buy like some uh, little, like about a yard of cotton, just simple cotton fabric um, in different colors. And I often use that just as like a tablecloth or like some kind of just a way to introduce some more color. Um, yeah, a pattern on fabric would work. Uh, absolutely. It will be a lot of work for you to paint. So just keep that in mind too. Um, I love painting patterns, but they are time consuming. And it depends on like how much of a pattern you're talking about. If they're like stripes or something like that, it might not take as long, but if it's like a real ornate pattern, then it might be a little more involved. 
Um, but think about it. I mean, that's totally an option for you. It's just going to be a bit more time consuming. Another uh, thought that uh, I didn't mention earlier is you could take, I'll just grab blue. Um, if you wanted to break up this background, you can actually drape fabric kind of in the back and then have it kind of come down across your composition that way too. So you might have some a couple of folds and then it ends up partly on the table and then you can have something else here. So just play around a little bit. Um, if you're worried about moving your composition, all of these objects here, you can always mark with tape kind of the positioning, um, like mark the tip of the feather, the position of the book, a little bit of where the jar is, the onion. So that way, if you have to take it apart, you still know where uh, things were laid out. That's what I do if I have to break down a, a still life. Okay, and so the only other thing I wanted to bring up, um, let me get back to ink, is I noticed that there is a tangent right here. Oh, let me draw in a different color here. Right here. Um, it's right where this line which we can't see the edge of the, yeah, it peeks out just a little bit here, but this is confusing because it seems like it could be part of the jar lid. Um, it, and then this hits right in this part and it's just a little visually um, unclear. So there's a couple of things you can do. You can straighten out the lid a little bit and just make a very clear overlap. So you just, kind of move it up that way. Or you can move this to about here. Just kind of nudge it in a little bit um, and then get rid of that line there. Um, this still kind of creates a point of tension though. So I think what might be the better option is just to kind of change the angle of this lid you know, angle it up a little bit more. So I'm just trying to imagine on the hinge here. And then there's other ways you can play that down um, in terms of value. So when you're working um, into your tonal painting, you might consider just, since this is going into cast shadow here, um, you might not put as much detail in this area and a little less contrast that might help this edge fade so it doesn't pull the eye right there, if that makes sense. Um, that'll especially be true if you make sure that whatever value is here is similar to this value here, then this edge won't become so um, prominent. Does that make sense? Okay, so I want to look at your ellipse here um, real quick. Tricky, tricky ellipses. Okay, so this here feels a little bit flattened. Um, what I'm going to do here real quick is... Now, what's happening in the jar is you have a lot of different ellipses that are kind of interacting. So you have the primary lip of the jar. Okay, and then you have this one here, which is, if we kind of followed that around, is like that. Um, and then you have this one here. So I would focus on the main ones. Um, and then let me just take that and I'm going to just put it over yours and we're going to just see how the ellipses 
are comparing once we get it to size. Oops, I do not want to skew that. Okay. So um, just a few areas. I actually think that this line is, this is where you have that line. You need to bring it down to here. And then this can get a little bit more narrow. Um, and then you'll need to correct this interior ellipse. I think your outside line on the top is fine. So this one here is good. Um, this one here, you're gonna wanna move down a little bit. And I think that should correct your ellipse. Yeah, just some minor changes um, and that will even that out. Ellipses are really hard. <laughs> um, just. If, especially if you're not using real complex perspective and you're just eyeballing it um, and you have something complicated like the rings of the jar and you have a lot of different ellipses kind of interacting, it's very easy to get overwhelmed and not know which one you're looking at. Um, so just keep that in mind. It, it doesn't need to be um, too complex in your drawing. Just getting those primary ellipses for the main lip of the jar and that's going to help. Um, something that also threw me off a little bit is this corner here. It almost makes this feel a, a little skewed if I look at kind of how these lines um, overall relate. And I think what's happening is camera distortion. Um, and so we want to correct a little bit of that. It's okay to have a tiny bit because of that's kind of how our eyes are, uh, they see. But I think if we, here, let me redo that on a new layer so I don't mess up the ellipse. Um, so I'll show you how maybe we, I know that frame is pretty complicated and you did a great job drawing the design. Uh, we're just gonna nudge a few things around and adjust that skew a little bit um, and it will help the whole image kind of read better. So um, let me think here. Let me figure out these tools here. Um, I, there's a way to adjust. Okay, there we go. All right, so, so what we can do is I think kind of straighten this out a little bit. So there's a slight distortion, but it's not as um, pronounced. And then we're gonna take that 
same one and shrink it down. And so what's crucial is that these interior, this interior square is parallel to the outside square. Um, and so what probably happened is it got a little bit skewed as you were getting involved in the details on the frame. So kind of like I mentioned earlier with doing anything that is really complicated and detailed, um, you want to make sure that you're thinking about the overall shape first and then go in and divide up all those details. Um, yeah, the frame is very complex in that way. Okay, so I think that will help. So what I would suggest is first, maybe correcting this interior square here. Um, just draw it in, it'll be the simplest thing you can do. And then I would draw this outside square and try and get these straightened out. So if you, there isn't actually that much work for you to change. Anything that falls outside of that just needs to be nudged in. And it's gonna mostly happen at this top where this feels um, skewed up here. Um, and then this, just bring that out. So you want these outer ones to pretty much just touch on this square. So lightly drawing in the square first will help. Um, then you can kind of, and you can even on your drawing, do it in a different color. So like take a colored pencil in yellow or something light, like a red, um, and draw your square. Um, get the square correct. And then go in with your pencil and adjust these. Does that make sense? So I'm just gonna leave it like that. Um, and that will help a lot, I think, just um, with the overall feeling of that picture frame. And it's not gonna feel like it's toppling off the, the panel or off the surface. Um, that's something to, we always want to keep in consideration when we're using photography. <clears throat> and this goes when you're painting a portrait or you're photographing anything. If you get too close, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, what can happen is that camera gives that fisheye effect. Um, so what's better if you're taking your photo reference is to stand back like four feet, five feet, and then use a zoom lens and zoom in. Um, and then you're not going to lose resolution, but you will um, have more of a, or less of a distorted photo to work from. Unfortunately, phones and things like that don't work for that. So if you have like an, um, a camera with that zoom capability, like a regular camera or a DSLR, then use that to take your photo reference. And that's one way to reduce the amount of distortion, especially if you're going to take this kind of bird's eye view um, for a, a composition. Yes, Lori, that's actually another thing you can do is zoom out um, a little bit more than what you think you want your composition to be and then you can crop. But you don't wanna do it too much because if you crop, you're reducing pixels and you'll lose resolution. So kind of, if you were to crop on this image, um, for example, um, let's say I was photographing this and I thought I wanted to be about this close in on my picture, I might crop more like in my camera, maybe include a little bit more of the environment like that. Um, and then I can crop in later um, and decide on my composition. The camera is a very useful tool for coming up with compositions because it's very quick and easy and we can kind of experiment a lot in a short amount of time instead of having to sit there and try and draw a bunch um, from you know either invention or which is good practice too, but the camera can help us, especially those if you tend to struggle with visualizing the border for your canvas, um, using a camera can help aid in that. And I don't have any problem with that. I'm sure there's some purists out there who do, but <laughs> I think it can be a very useful tool and I utilize it a lot um, when I'm working as well. So try a couple of those suggestions. Um, I think the feather is a really nice touch. Um, 
And so maybe having that little sprig kind of mimicking that angle of the feather can help to again pull us into kind of this and this as the focal point I would say so um, and if you feel like this is too like obvious of a direction you could try even cutting this onion and having like two little halves um, that's up to you but try the sprig first and see how you like it Or it could even be just like a branch off of a tree or a plant that you like. It can be some rosemary or some uh, uh, lavender. That might be another way to kind of introduce some color. Lavender has like some nice soft greens, but then you'll add a little bit of purple. So that might be nice too, is some little dried lavender or something that might uh, work well. All right, I'm glad to hear you're excited. Uh, you have an extra week to work on this drawing, so take your time, especially with that frame um, and working out some of these solutions, playing with the idea of introducing some fabric or some different colors. Alrighty, good job. Okay, everyone, um, let's go ahead and open up again for just general questions. Does anyone have anything they would like to ask before we end our session? It's, it is a short session. This time, next time will be a little bit longer because we'll have more work uh, to go over. Um, you think your ground is too dark and how you lighten it. Are you talking about the, um, the imprimatura or the tone that you applied to your panel? Um, if you ended up toning your canvas too dark, there's a few ways you can lighten it, um, but it's not that Okay. Oh, you're prime. Okay. You're so your initial toning on the canvas. Um, you don't, if it's too dark, it depends on how dark it is. Could you send me a picture? Um, I usually go for a middle value. So like a value five, which is actually quite dark compared to white. Um, the white of the canvas. Don't worry because we will be adding white. So if you toned your panel too dark, there is a way to kind of redeem that, um, by scumbling the light mass. Um, with white, you'll see, you'll no, understand better when you see me demonstrate the um, tonal sketch. Um, because we do go darker with glazing and then we also scumble in a little bit of light to get a very general value sketch um, established before we move into the grisaille painting layers. Um, but if yours is like really, really dark, like near black, then you might want to either take a little bit of Gamzol and remove some of the tone. Um, if you just rub it with a little bit of a rag and um, some, even like some cheesecloth can actually work really well because it doesn't leave behind lint. Um, with a little bit of Gamzol, you will find that it starts to lift um, some of that tone. And it might lift it all the way. It depends on how long it's been setting and what kind of um, primer you're working on. If it's like an acrylic ground, it's going to be more absorbent. And if it's an oil ground, it's going to be less absorbent. So it might come off easier on the oil ground. So it kind of depends, but I would just experiment and there's nothing wrong with just wiping it all off um, and then trying again. So uh, Janet, you said, I haven't started my drawing yet. Any recommendations on size? You'll be using my photo. Okay, um, so there was a little discrepancy in my recommendation on the supply list and what I ended up painting my um, painting as. So I did mine 16 by 20 and I partly did that because I wanted to be able to paint as much detail as possible and have it easy um, to film and have it come across in the, the video footage. Um, but it is quite large and it is a lot of area to cover. So, um, I mean, it's large for as detailed as will be. So 11 by 14 can work. Um, 
you, if you wanted to go some slightly bigger, you might try 12 by 16. Um, I prob that's probably the size I would have selected um, if I didn't want to do 16 by 20. Um, so try if you want to try 11 by 14. One way to to kind of experiment is to um, print it out on a 11 by 17, uh, just like at a Kinko's or a, a print shop. Just print the photo at 11 by 17 because it'll come out about 11 by 14 and that'll give you a sense of the scale um, of what that might look like. And you might find yourself wanting to paint it a little bit bigger. Um, it really depends on how complex this still life is. But since mine has several objects in it, you might find yourself wanting to paint it a little bit bigger than 11 by 14. Um, but that's up to you. Some people love to paint small. Um, so, and you might be really have a lot of control over that. So the smaller you paint, the harder it is to kind of get those details in. Um, so try printing it out and just get a feel for that 11 by 14 size. And if not, maybe go up to like 12 by 16. Okay, Marilyn, could just, why don't you email me the ground picture of your ground and I'll um, get back to you right after the critiques here. And I'll just, uh, I'll let you know if maybe you want to try removing some of that. And your question is procreate with Photoshop. I'd love to be able to do the grid over my photo, but I don't have Photoshop. Okay. Um, no, it's not. It's a actually a completely different company. So if you have an Apple like iPad, um, just go to the app store and type in procreate. Um, it's a free app, which is great. And then you just download it and you can start right away. So there's no, but I would, I only mentioned Photoshop earlier because Photoshop is, you know, Procreate has really expanded the abilities in there and it's starting to kind of compete with Photoshop. Um, and so Adobe Photoshop is releasing a, they will be releasing a version for mobile devices like um, tablets uh, of Photoshop. And I think it's their way of competing with Procreate. Um, it's a great, uh, little program. I use it for digital sketching as well. Um, so it's a great way to play around with your imagery and also to do some analysis. Um, I'll be posting a bonus video a little bit later uh, this week where I do a little digital sketch and I'll show you how and some of the tools that you can use. Um, and what's great is if you go just search on the internet um, and you can type in like procreate brushes, you'll find some people have designed different brushes. Um, it comes with a bunch already, but um, you can find a couple of different brushes that imitate oil paint very, uh, pretty well. I mean, it's not gonna look exactly like an oil painting, but um, I had downloaded a set called Sargent's Oils, and I really like um, this set. They have a glaze, which allows you to do something kind of transparent. Um, So you can see it's just, if I, let me increase the opacity here. So you can see it's just creating a little bit of a glaze, but it allows that whatever's underneath to show through. Some have a canvas texture. Um, and I bought this one. I think I paid maybe five bucks for the brush set, but um, you can find free ones out there too. And you just import them in to procreate and it gives you a lot of different options. Um, there's actually some really neat effects that you can play around with too. I really like their charcoal. I find that it actually looks quite convincing and I've done a couple of digital drawings um, in Procreate um, using these and just, just for fun. Um, sometimes it's nice if I'm sitting at home and I, I want to draw or doodle, um, but I don't wanna sit there and like be sharpening pencils on my couch <laughs> or using charcoal. I'll, I'll just sketch on, on my iPad. Um, it is easier if you have an iPad um, that has the Apple Pencil capability. Um, just, but you can use any kind of stylus. I used, I used to draw with just with a regular stylus. Um, and if you don't have an iPad, try to see if they have an, if you have a, um, another type of device like a Android tablet. You can try um, seeing if Procreate. I think they have a version for. Um, a, like a uh, Android. I'd have to look into it for you, but um, if, if I do find one, I'll go ahead and post it in the forum. Uh, 
Um, okay, so is, are there any other questions? Oh, I don't know why your message was retracted, Ludmilla. Here, let's see. Sometimes, uh, Ludmilla, I think that, that uh, YouTube thought you were trying to sell something because <laughs> you said the word free. Um, they retracted your message. Um, but yes, Procreate is a free app. Um, Lori, it, okay, so did you watch the video on kind of how to uh, get around the website? So if you go to my YouTube channel after this, if you just click on my little um, icon, you'll find the video there on how to get through our, our website and kind of navigate. So if you log in where you view your courses, um, if you go to my course library, you will see the class itself and then you will see something called community forum. And if you click on the community forum, you'll see different topics uh, line up and then you'll see one specifically for this class that says classical still life in oils. And if you open there, I've posted stuff in that forum. You can post and share your work and get written feedback from me um, on your drawing or any um, ask, ask uh, I, I will answer any questions you have. Um, and uh, you can get feedback and I sometimes post resources on supplies and, and that kind of stuff there. Oh, okay, good. All righty. You're very welcome. Thank you guys for attending. Um, we're going to go ahead and end our session, and we will be back on next Saturday. So if you have questions, just write them down, and um, you can either, if you can't attend the live and you'd like me to answer the question, you can email me the question, and I'll, I'll get to it. Um, or you can just sign in, and we'll uh, answer it live. Um, I will be sending out a new link every week for attending these live sessions. So just check your email that morning, about 15 minutes before we go live, and you'll find that new link. All right, thank you guys for attending, and I will see you in the forum, and I look forward to seeing all of your work. Have a great weekend, guys.